Hi, this is not going to be an SL3 unboxing video. What this is going to be is a video about how I set up this camera. So once you've taken the camera out of the box, maybe that's a good time to stop and have a think about how you're gonna configure the camera when you go out shooting. Okay, we've got the camera out of the box. I've put on my favorite lens, the 50mm Summicron. And the idea of this video is to explain to you what changes I make to the defaults. Most of the defaults in the menus are reasonably sensible, but there's a few that I prefer to change just to make the camera work better for me. And remember, when you configure this camera, and you set all the customizable buttons, you're making this camera an extension of your own hand. So the idea is that you should never really need to go into the menus themselves once you've made these decisions. So it's the old uh, measure twice, cut once principle is set the camera up first, give it some serious thought how you want it to work, make sure that the controls work consistently. And then when you go out shooting, it becomes much, much easier. Okay, the other thing I've done, and you can see on the screen on my laptop here, um, I've totally nerded out so that you don't have to, and I've gone through all of the menus, and I've just made a spreadsheet of all of the defaults and all of the things that I've changed, so I can keep track explaining to you what I've been doing. It's quite a lot. For instance, there's 67 different options for this particular button here. Anyway, don't be put off by that. It's not going to be uh, too difficult a video, but it might be quite a long one, so I should warn you. Okay, well, we should start by turning the camera on. And I've reset this camera back to factory default, so everything you see now should be as you see your camera when you take it out of the box. Bear in mind that Leica usually has some last minute firmware updates just before release. So it's entirely possible that if you're watching this video near to the release date, there may be a firmware update which might make some very subtle changes or optimizations to the way the camera works. But as far as I can tell, and this was recorded just before release, this is the most up to date version of firmware we've got. If something major changes, I will simply release a short update video, which you can watch in the future. Okay, let's turn the camera on. When you turn the camera on, you should see the, the welcome screen and you'll see a cool little animation pop up on the back here with the new tilt screen, which is a very, very cool new feature of the, the camera. And then it'll probably prompt me for language. There we go. And then it will ask me if I want to set up through the app, which I don't want to do. So I'm just going to hit the X button. Do I want to cancel? Yes, I do. There we go. Now I'm going to change my time zone to Sydney because I'm in Australia, plus 10. And I'm just going to leave the rest of it alone because it'll obviously be <laughs> different for you. So click again. Whoops. There we go. Tap the shutter button. And now we're into the normal screen on the back of the camera. Nothing much will appear to have changed at this point. This will all look quite familiar, although you may notice that a lot of the icons, say a lot, all of the icons have been completely redesigned for clarity. Right, let us start with the menus. The first thing we'll do is go through all seven pages of the menus, then we'll go on to the configurable buttons, and then at the end, I've got a little bit of a surprise for you because there is some other customizations which aren't immediately apparent, and I'll go through those at the end. So let's go to the menu. And the first thing you'll see is the simple menu quick access screen, which we'll come back to later. And I'm going to go to the main menu here. All right, this is page number one. Okay, let's go through page number one. First of all, we have focus mode and by default, you can see it's set to AFS. I will leave that alone because that is my preferred choice. I find that single shot autofocus works best for me. You do have the choice of AI um, focusing, which means it chooses autofocus single or autofocus continuous, depending on its analysis of the subject. Personally, my habit is to, is to leave it on single frame, um, so single shot, unless I need to change it to um, continuous. AF mode, and again, I'm going to leave this one on default. Previous cameras used to have multi-field as default, which I don't like because that means the camera is actually choosing the focus point for you. And I think it's very important that you choose the focus point because that's communicating to your viewer where the point of interest is. So field works really well. We that's And I'm gonna leave it there, but but at some point I will choose eye, face and body detection, but I'll do that on a case by case basis later. And I will set up my custom buttons in such a way that, such a way that I can access that quickly. So my default is going to be field. Okay. 
Focus settings. Now I'm going to leave most of the focus settings alone, especially the AF setup, because there are all sorts of little tweaks that you can do to change how the focus behaves. And that is again, very much a case by case decision. So I'm gonna leave those on default for the moment. Remember, this is a general configuration for the camera. It doesn't take into account special circumstances that you might come across. The idea is to make the camera easy to use and then easy to change quickly when circumstances change. Focus aids, uh, again, assist lamp and auto magnification will leave on. Touch AF, now I'm going to change this because uh, there are circumstances when you're using the rear screen to access menu items, or if your nose touches the screen, there are circumstances where it will actually pick that up as you wanting to focus or fire the camera or change the size of the actual focusing area, things like that. So I'm going to turn that off because I find that to be slightly irritating the way that I shoot. By all means, if you like focusing and shooting using the rear screen by tapping it with your finger, fine, feel free. But personally, I generally shoot with the camera up to my eye, so having access to the touch screen for controlling the camera isn't really relevant. Leave that one off and manual focus throw. Now here's another thing which I'm gonna change. This is basically when you rotate the focusing ring how far do you rotate it when you're manually focusing but um, for each change of distance? So sometimes you want to turn it a long way to, to move a short distance. Sometimes you want to move it a short distance to change the focus a lot. I prefer to leave, take this off standard and put it on 90 degrees. That now makes the camera, again, when you're focusing manually with the ring, much more responsive. Uh, this is something that you might have to just try a few different settings and see what feels right for you. Some people prefer a much, much more long throw. I prefer a short throw for what I do. So I'm gonna put that on 90 degrees. All right, come out of there. Next setting on page one is exposure metering. And again, the default is multi-field and this is where I use um, the camera 99.99% .99 of the time, maybe, I'd use spot metering, but because of the way I actually set my exposures using the histogram and the exposure highlight warning, this is really not that important. So leave this on multi-field and you won't go too far wrong. Now, ISO settings, there's quite a bit to talk about here. Let's go into ISO settings. The most important one is the auto ISO setting, and that is something I use quite a bit. Auto, auto ISO can be incredibly useful when circumstances are changing with your, your indoors or outdoors, the lights changing and so on. So don't dismiss it as a sort of amateur mode. It's actually very, very useful, but it has to be configured correctly so it works in your favor. And there is a big gotcha, which I'll explain in a minute. Auto ISO, the default maximum auto ISO setting will be 6,400. Now, given that this camera goes up to 100,000, it seems that we're shortchanging ourselves a little bit here. I'm going to change this just to the maximum. And there's a very good reason for that. If you find that the, the aperture you set and the shutter speed you've set and the light levels that you're facing don't give you a correct exposure and your ISO needs to go up and up and up and up to 6,400, then it hits that ceiling and then there's two things can happen. Either the auto ISO can honor the minimum shutter speed you've set, which we'll come to in a sec, the shutter speed limit, in which case at lower light levels, the picture will become progressively darker or it will override your minimum shutter speed, your shutter speed limit, and you'll get a correctly exposed image, but your shutter speed will drop and you might end up with camera shake. Personally, I prefer the former. Leica's policy is the latter. So it wants to give you a correct exposure as a priority. Personally, I'd rather have a sharp picture as a priority. Okay, so that, that neither option is better or worse than the other. It's just my thinking leads me to that conclusion. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to change, um, well, I could change this to a specific shutter speed. Okay, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on auto. And what does auto mean? Well, I did some tests and auto seems to mean the minimum shutter speed that auto ISO will let you use until it hits its highest ISO threshold will be double the focal length of the lens in, expressed in terms of shutter speed. For instance, if I'm using this 50mm Simicron um, at my minimum shutter speed, 
before the ISO starts to go up will be one, one at one hundredth of a second because it's a 50 millimeter lens, double 50 is 100. So that will be the minimum shutter speed that your uh, exposure will go down to before it starts pushing the ISO up. And then that ISO will go up to 100,000 before it starts overriding that shutter speed. F2 on this lens at a hundredth of a second at 100,000 ISO, I would say you probably couldn't even see your way around without a torch, it'd be that dark. So I think we've covered all bases there. Okay, so that's the auto ISO settings. The next two options we've got are floating ISO, which I'm going to leave on. Floating ISO is essentially when you have a zoom with a variable aperture, like the 24 to 90. If you've set, say, F8 at a 250th of a second in manual, if you zoom from one end of the scale to the other, it might change that exposure. So floating ISO means that it uses ISO to compensate for the loss of light as you go from wide angle to telephoto. So instead of overriding the shutter speed or the aperture, it will override the ISO and maintain your setting. That's all that does. ISO increments, I'm going to leave that alone. If you prefer to shoot in half or one stop ISO increments, that's up to you, but I'm gonna leave it in a third. It's a little bit finer. Some people might make a strong argument for doing it in whole steps, um, but it's entirely up to you what you do there. So I'm going to leave that on default. All right, that is page number one. Let's move on to page number two. Okay, page two, let's move on. EV increment, same reasoning. I'm going to leave that on one third. Drive mode, we have the option here to shoot either single frames, which is my preference, which is the default, and I'm going to leave it there. But you do have the option of shooting continuous, uh, and you have two, four, five, six, seven, nine, fifteen. So there's a lot of options there. But for general purpose shooting, single shot seems to work best for me. Interval shooting, um, I don't shoot time lapses, so I'm going to leave that on default. But I am going to make a change in exposure bracketing because the default here is the number of frames three and the EV steps one. Now, number of frames, yes, I will go with that. Three frames suits me, but the EV steps uh, isn't enough. Um, plus one either side doesn't really achieve a great deal. I'm going to change that to plus and minus two. That now covers a, lot, a, much wider, a much wider range of brightness and can be blended in Lightroom or Photoshop later without any trouble at all. Exposure compensation on zero, you can set the entire set of exposures to be uh, exposure compensated as well, which is quite handy. Leave that on default. Automatic merely means that the three shots in this case will be um, fired off in sequence with one press the shutter button. So we'll leave that on default as well. Okay, so that's drive mode. Self timer. Um, the new menus in the camera have the option to turn on and off the sub menus. So what I see, self timer's off, but I don't know what the self timer would be if I turned it on. So that's why I, why I need to check that. So I'm gonna turn on self timer by clicking once and you'll see the little button is lit up. Then I go to settings and then the default is 12. Now I use the self timer almost exclusively to trigger long exposures. So I press the shutter, um, wait two seconds and then the exposure starts. So that's when I'm on a tripod and I don't want any vibrations. Very rarely use 12 seconds. So the most useful one for me um, in most circumstances is two seconds. So if I set that and then come back and turn that off, I can now turn on and off self timer and it will go to two seconds and then off to two seconds and off. It, that seems a much more logical way of working. You can also access the self timer in another way, which I will show you later. So I've now chosen when I turn on the self timer, the number of settings it will give me immediately. Okay. White balance is set to auto white balance. That's a perfectly reasonable place to leave the camera if you're shooting uh, JPEGs and if you're shooting RAW. However, given that I only shoot RAW, and given that I can change the white balance later in post with zero cost, that's one of the great advantages of shooting RAW, my inclination is to set it onto daylight only because daylight is much harder to fool um, than uh, auto white balance. If you are photographing something that's almost exclusively blue or almost exclusively red, orange, like a sunset, you'll find that the auto white balance gives you a very misleading view on the LCD screen or through the EVF. It will look really muted and washed out, even though if you're shooting raw, it will capture it fine. If you have the camera set to the correct 
white balance for those circumstances, you'll find the colors look a lot more true through the viewfinder. Now, it doesn't matter, even if those colors look weird, you can, st when it, you open it in Lightroom and you change the order, the, when you change the white balance to what it should have been, daylight, the colors will come back. But it's just a little bit misleading if you don't know how to interpret what you're seeing. So for me, I put that on white, that white balance onto daylight and I leave it there. If I'm shooting indoors under strong tungsten lights, I may change it to uh, tungsten just so I can see what the colors are going to look like. But again, you can always make that change in Photoshop and Lightroom later on. And if you wonder why the screen's going out, it's because we haven't got to change in the defaults on the power savings mode yet. So right now the defaults should turn it off only after only a relatively short period of time. So that's white balance. File format um, default is JPEG and DNG. I'm going to change that to DNG and leave it there. So that is everything on page two. Let's move on to page three. Okay, page three. The first item on the list is DNG resolution and the default is large DNG. You do have the option of shooting 60, 36 or 18 megapixel images. The lower resolutions give you a little bit of extra dynamic range. However, I don't use these cameras to shoot low res images. I want the maximum possible resolution that the camera can do. So I always leave it on 60 megapixels. That's just my choice. Feel free to change that if you wish, but let's leave that alone. Now, JPEG settings, again, I'm going to uh, leave them on default because I don't shoot JPEGs, but there is one circumstance um, where I will change these um, options and I'll show you what that is. And that is if I want to shoot black and white, or let's say I have it in my mind that this shot is going to look like black, it's going to look good in black and white. I can preview the black and white effect in the viewfinder, but still capture a raw file. And it's the JPEG settings that you need to change, even though I'm shooting only DNG. So what I'm going to do is leave all these alone, except for film style. And then I'm going to go into right down the bottom, the next page, monochrome high contrast, which I think looks really good. Then I'm going to make one change to that, just in case I do shoot a JPEG. And that's the sharpness. And I'm going to take the sharpness down to minus two. Um, you might need to experiment, experiment with this depending on your output, whether it's to large print or to uh, social media or small prints or something like that, because sharpness cannot be done as a general setting. Sharpness has to be calculated based on the size of the output, whether it's computer screen, iPad, phone or a print. And the bigger the print, the less the, the less the sharpening needs to be in terms of various parameters like radius and amount and so on. If you sharpen too much at a smaller size and then enlarge it, you'll see those halos, those sharpening halos, which are quite unsightly. So a, a JPEG that sharpened in camera and then printed really big, it'll look beautiful, except for you'll probably see those white halos around it. So I would rather sharpen less in camera and more in post then I can control it. Come out of JPEG settings. Noise reduction, long exposure is on by default. What that means is that if you did say a four second exposure, the camera would then do a second exposure immediately afterwards for also four seconds, but it would do, do so with the shutter closed. So it's recording only black, therefore only noise. Then the two images can be subtracted in a way of speaking from each other and the noise being random tends to disappear because um, if you do that, then random noise being the pixels are in different places and they tend to cancel each other out. It works really well. So this is an effective setting for long exposures. However, if you absolutely need to shoot an, a, a shot straight afterwards, or if you're doing like a four minute exposure, and bear in mind, this camera will do 60 minute exposures. If you did a 60 minute exposure, you would have to wait another 60 minutes <laughs> to actually get the next shot. So you might choose to turn this off what I suggest you do is do some tests, do some 15 second exposures or something in the, in the dusk uh, and just see the difference between on and off. There are differences. I'm not going to spoil the surprise for you. Do your own tests. See what you think is ex um, acceptable. Um, there is a difference between the files. It is relatively subtle, but how you deal with that will be up to you. That's not the subject of this video. Perspective control I'm going to leave off by default. You can turn on perspective control directly through a certain 
uh, method I'll show you later. So you can leave this off now. And then sensor format, well, it's a full frame lens, a full frame camera, sensor format 35 millimeter. Um, I can toggle between APS-C and 35 millimeter. It does choose that automatically if you were to put something like a TL lens on it, which is a fantastic lens uh, range to be using, but you will reduce the resolution to, off top of my head, 26 megapixels, and it will automatically change the sensor format here to APS-C. All right, that is page number three. Let's move on to page number four. Okay, page number four, and there's a lot to talk about on page number four, because that's where we have the customized controls, and there's quite a few things we'll need to change there. All right, from the top, stabilization is on by default. I strongly recommend that you leave that on default. Um, if you're hand-holding, why not use a stabilizer? It works really well. The, um, the quoted amount of stabilization is five stops of shutter speed. My tests show that that's absolutely correct, if not more. So I can usually hand-hold with this lens down to about half a second with quite consistent results if I'm careful. So there seems to be no downside to having the stabilizer um, on all the time. Aspect ratio, um, I'm always shooting three to two, uh, which is full frame. Um, if you had some reason to change that, by all means change the proportions if you shoot square pictures a lot. But my thinking is leave it on three to two and crop later in post. If you were again shooting JPEGs or specific images, like if you were shooting um, test stills in the movie industry, you might choose to shoot JPEGs and set the format to 16 to nine or whatever the actual production was using just to shoot sort of location pictures and get the framing right. But that's kind of a special case. We're talking about generically setting up the camera so that it works in most circumstances later. Flash settings don't use flash, so I'm going to skip past that. All right, now customized controls. Okay, there is a lot to talk about here. Now we're getting into that topic of how you make the camera work for you. That's really important. Okay, let's go through the function buttons. Now, this is not setting the actual function buttons. This is setting the options that are available through the function buttons. So I'm not going to do the function buttons yet. That will come at the end of the menu section of this video. But just a short just a little sort of heads up, when you long press a function button like the FN button here or one of the others, long press it, you will get a list of options. The FN button option here allows you to set which options are available to you when you long press one of these buttons. And there are 67 of them, I counted them, so that you don't have to. <laughs> um, I just leave them all on. It just means that when you want to choose an option with the function button, it might take you a few more seconds to scroll through them all, looking for the one that you're, uh, you need. However, the idea here is to set the camera up and then leave it alone. Reconfiguring the camera is not something that you necessarily want to do very often. And if you do need to reconfigure the camera, that's what user profiles are for because that allows you to set up the camera in different ways and then save those as user profiles and then flick between them rather than having to go and reconfigure the camera. So there's many levels to this if you think about it. So I'm going to leave that alone on default and just leave all the options turned on. Dials, okay, this gets a little bit tricky. So we have settings for dials using AF lenses like the Summicron I've got on the camera now. But if I was to use uh, an M lens, uh, I've got one right here, like this, my favorite little 18 millimeter. If I was to use this lens, I would I can set the dials to work in a different way, which allows for a lot of configuration, but also quite confusing. So let's do AF lenses. Now the dials also <laughs> can work differently depending on which exposure mode you're in. For instance, you can have program, aperture priority, shutter priority, and manual, and you can have the dials one, two, and three work in different ways depending on which mode you're, you're in. My thinking on this is that the dial should always do the same thing so that this will always be an ISO dial. This will always be um, the aperture dial where appropriate and this will always be the exposure compensation dial where appropriate. Now clearly if you're using an M lens or an R lens the aperture is set on the lens. So you don't need to set this to be the actual f-stop. Okay, so that's why I mean where appropriate. So let's go into this. So 
I don't use program mode, so I'm going to ignore this one. If you do use program mode, what I talk about next will, will, will give you an idea of how you should set that up. I'm going to go to aperture priority mode, which is where I shoot 95% of my pictures, possibly 99% of my pictures. Very occasionally I use manual when I need to lock the, lock the exposure, but just all the time, aperture priority just works for me. So in aperture priority mode, the thumb wheel, which is this one, is set to the f-stop. Now I want to set this to exposure compensation. The way I measure my exposures is I use the exposure highlight warning, I let the camera do the first guess in aperture priority, and then I override it using the thumb dial based on the flashing highlights in the histogram. That's my exposure technique. And I find that having that dial under my thumb is just a very intuitive way of working. So I'm gonna change the thumb dial to exposure compensation. The right hand dial now needs to be aperture, and the left-hand dial stays on ISO. Okay, now let's do manual mode. So we'll click here, go down to manual mode. Now I want those dials to do the same thing. So if I change from manual to aperture priority and back, I want to know that the dials do exactly the same thing. So the left-hand dial stays on ISO, the right-hand dial stay will be shutter, uh, no, that's gonna be f-stop, because that's what I had it in aperture priority as well. And that leaves the thumb dial to be the shutter speed, as you can see there. So I now have consistency of these two dials. And given that exposure compensation is irrelevant in manual mode, but I do need to check the shutter speed, it makes sense to put it on the dial there. Okay. Okay, let's do manual lenses. So that's vintage lenses and current M series lenses. Now bear in mind that with M lenses, you set the, the aperture on the lens itself, not on the dials. So with MF lenses, I need to work in aperture priority again. The thumb wheel is exposure compensation. The right hand dial needs to be magnification because with a manual lens, when you are, you've got no autofocus, so it, you can just dial in the magnification and work that way. You can also, access magnification on the joystick, which is the way I usually work. But if you want to vary the amount of magnification, you can use this dial here, okay. Then going to manual mode, pretty much the same thing, but I've got the right hand dial set to shutter speed, uh, to shutter speed, sorry, right hand dial. I've got the thumb wheel set to magnification, so I need to reverse those for consistency. Thumb wheel needs to be on shutter speed, right hand dial needs to be on magnification, and left hand dial remains on ISO. So all of those settings, this is for ISO, this is exposure compensation or shutter speed, and this is aperture or magnification. So that's consistent across all those settings. Okay, so joystick, I'm going to leave that alone in AF mode, but in manual focus mode, and this is actually how I operate with my autofocus lenses, because in manual mode, absolutely you can use the dial on the lens or the, the ring on the lens, but also you can choose that AFS on the joystick, not magnification. So the reason I use the joystick here is because when I'm in manual focus mode, I can toggle autofocus by clicking the joystick and it triggers AFS. And then when I let go, it goes back to manual focus, which means that when I press the shutter button, it doesn't refocus. Essentially what I've done is I've separated the function of the shutter, the shutter button and the joystick button. Normally the shutter button autofocuses and releases the shutter, but I want to be able to release the shutter and autofocus separately. It's called rear button focus and it works brilliantly. It's my definitely my preferred choice. Joystick lock, we'll leave that off. Um, touch icons in play mode, leave those on. That will become apparent what those do later on. All right, then back to the main menu and capture assistance. Okay, take a deep breath. This is gonna continue um, in great detail because there's again, a lot more to talk about. Page four is the big one for sure. Capture assistance. This is where you can set the views on the back of the camera, and there's four of them. Before I get to those though, image overlay. This allows me to create a small JPEG 
file, which gives me, which can be used as an overlay over what I see through the viewfinder. And you can set it to different transparencies. The idea is if you're a commercial photographer and you're shooting to some sort of layout, you can make yourself a little graphic, which allows you to place objects in your frame according to where they need to be according to that layout. So it gives you, and how you do that's up to you. It might be that you're shooting for a double page spread in a magazine. The left-hand page is completely text, but transparent, so you can see the image behind it. The image needs to be the full width of the two pages, but the actual subject of the picture is only, let's say, on the right-hand page. That means you could make a little graphic that has the left-hand side slightly grayed out, and the right-hand side transparent, and then you know that you shouldn't be composing in that left-hand side of the picture. You need to compose in the right-hand side of the picture only and let the rest of the image just bleed off behind that text. It's a very, very useful tool um, in very specific circumstances. But right now, we'll just leave that off. <laughs> okay, the image profiles. This, there's four of them, one, two, three, four, and they're all turned on at the moment. It may be that you want to have the same information on the rear screen all the time, in which case you can just set one of these and turn the other three off. Or it might be that you want different information on the back of the camera based on whatever you're, you need at the time. For instance, sometimes it's good to have expo um, focus peaking on, sometimes it's good to have focus peaking off. Sometimes you might want a clean image with no distractions at all, and you might want the, the level indicator available, but not on all the time. So it allows you to set four different combinations of all of the available information on the back of the camera. So it's a little bit complicated, but once you set it up, leave it alone and you'll be fine. And also most of the things that I change um, are just um, subtle. The vast majority of the, the settings in these are perfectly okay on default. So I'm only gonna change a few of them. Okay, info profile one. This I leave on default. So we have, I'm just referring to my spreadsheet here. The top bars and bottom bars are on, the grid is off, the clip is off, peaking is off, leveling is off, and histogram is, uh, is off. And as you'll see here, when I go into that, they are all off. Okay, so that's the first one. The second one, I should have again on default. That's this is the clean one, so everything is off. The first one, just going back to the first one, the only thing that's on there, oops, is the info bars. Everything else is turned off. So you'll see top and bottom on right. I missed that before, my apologies. Just to go miss off. Okay, just checking. So info profile two, the everything should be off. So that's your clean view. Info profile number three, settings. This is the one where I turn off the focus peaking because focus peaking can be toggled on or off using the rear viewfinder, something I'll come to later on. It's not something that I particularly want to have on all the time. So I'm going to change the clipping, uh, sorry, the focus peaking to off and then leave it alone. We also have the clipping on and that is your flashing highlights to, to warn you that a particular part of the picture is being recorded at more than 253 out of 255 values. So that is my focus peaking one. Then the last one, info profile four, we are, this is where we have the grid and the level. So if I having uh, problems framing a picture or I need to make sure something's geometrically correct or whatever, I can have my grid and my level on as well. So that particular one has everything on default once again. So really, we've only actually changed one thing here. But I hope you get the idea that you can change these to anything you want um, according to the way you work. And you, you only actually need one of these if, uh, if you find that's important to you. It's very, very versatile but a little bit confusing to set up. This is why I'm stressing, I suppose, I've said it a few times, it's a really good idea to do all this thinking now, not whilst you're out shooting. Okay, we got through page number four. Let's move on to page number five. Okay, page number five coming up. Storage management. Uh, essentially, the default of this is where I'm going to leave it. Um, this is how you would format your card. Right now, there's two slots. One is a CF Express card, one is an SD card. It will fill up one for the other if there is both in there. Otherwise, it will just fill up the card that's in there. So I'm going to leave that on default. And then edit file name, I'm going to leave that on default too because I 
do all my file naming in Lightroom later, so you can leave that alone. So there's not an awful lot to change there. Shutter's type, I'm going to leave on uh, default, which is hybrid. The only difference there really is that if you shoot electronic, the camera makes almost no noise unless you want it to. It also allows you access to a 16,000th of a second, whereas the mechanical shutter only goes up to, uh, only goes up to an 8,000th. So we can leave that on default. Auto review, the def this is off. Up to you what you do here. My preference is to do this one, which is also the default. What I don't want is the camera to put up a preview, or sorry, a review of the shot I've just taken in front of my eye in the viewfinder, which a lot of cameras do by default. And previous cameras in the Leica range used to have this set to one or three seconds. For me, it's either off. I don't want to see the picture until I choose to later, because it's just a distraction, or, I have the option here of as long as I don't release a shutter button, it will throw up a preview, a re sorry, it will, pre it will show up a review of the last shot as long as I hold my finger down. And then as soon as I release it, we're on to live view again. I find that really useful because sometimes you're just experimenting with your shot and you want to see how it's sort of looking. And this gives you the option under your thumb, under your forefinger rather, to hold that shot and then release it if you like. So that's my preference. So I'm going to leave that, I'm going to turn that on and set it to, and then it, that default is the shutter pressed option. Group display mode, um, I because I don't shoot continuous very much, this doesn't really make any difference for me. The idea is if you shoot a whole burst of pictures, you'll see them as a single thumbnail and there'll be a little number on it saying how many there are in that little stack. So it saves you having to scroll through loads and loads of shots um, it's a bit like stacking in, uh, in Lightroom. I'm going to leave that alone. Um, it's not something I use very often. Gosh, that was a quick page, wasn't it? That was page number five. And now we're going to move on to page number six. Okay, page number six. There we go. Live view settings, PASM. I'm going to leave that alone. What this does is it allows you to turn off any sort of exposure preview when you're in manual mode. This is only really useful if you're shooting in a studio using Studio Flash, because if your Studio Flash is, say, really powerful and you're shooting at the sync speed, which is a 200th of a second at, let's say, f16, then that will be a very incorrect ambient light exposure in the studio. And if you have it set to exposure preview and manual, you'll look through the camera and you'll see just nothing, or maybe a very faint shadow. It'll look seriously underexposed, which of course it would be if you were shooting with continuous light, but the strobe will overpower that and you'll get a correct exposure. So it's very difficult to work with the camera. What you do is you simply toggle it to PAS, and then there's no exposure preview in manual mode, and you can simply see through the camera irrespective of the exposure you've set. So pretty much only for studio photography. Enhanced view, um, enhanced live view. This is when the light levels get really, really low and you need to critically focus in manual. You will turn that on to boost the signal into the live view mode. The, ex the price you pay is it gets quite grainy, but at least it makes it brighter so you can see focus. So it's only really for when the light levels are low and you need to critically manually focus. Like a photos, I'm going to leave that all on default. USB charging, I'm going to leave that on because I do charge the camera through the USB port right here. USB mode is set up by default to select. So that means that when you plug a USB cable in, you'll choose the setting you need based on what you're doing, whether it's power or whether it's mass storage or whether you're tethering. So I'll leave that on default. Wi-Fi, I will leave on default as well. And now we're on page seven, which is the last page. So we're on the home straight here. User profile, I'm going to leave that alone for the moment because once I've finished all of my settings, I would then go into my user profiles and save as a new user profile or an existing user profile with a new name, I should say. But I have to do that right at the very end because that would save the state of the camera right now and I haven't finished yet. Camera settings. Okay, there's quite a bit to talk about here. Just checking through my spreadsheet to make sure I've got them all listed down. All right. Display settings. Uh, we can leave those pretty much on default. Um, in fact, there's nothing there I want to change except 
If you want to make the image in the LCD viewfinder, sorry, the EVF look a little smoother, you could change that to 120 frames per second. Um, that tends to make movement a little more, bit smoother. Hard to tell the difference, so um, feel free to change that if you want. In Rotate Info Bars, leave that on. One of the new features of the camera is that when you shoot vertically, the info bars will rotate so that all the icons are oriented in the correct direction, which is really cool. You'll see that when you actually turn the camera on its side. So leave that on default. Power saving. This is why my screen's been going out periodically. Let's turn on the power settings, which is, is by default, but let's just change the settings to a bit longer. So auto power off completely, five minutes and displays off let's change let's change that to five minutes as well that i think makes more sense let's just double check those yeah that's much more sensible leave put those onto five minutes each um then the power button uh that changes the brightness of the power button if you want so again leave that on default so that's power savings, distance units, default, acoustic signal. You can have the camera make beeps if you wish. I'll leave that on default. Um, date and time we can do, we've already done, more or less. Uh, reset image numbering, sensor cleaning, pixel mapping, reset camera. These are all things that you might, uh, like special functions that you would that you would do later. They're not really configurations, they're, they're options, functions. Camera information is all about the firmware. There's no options in there. It's just telling you uh, what you need, except when you upgrade firmware. And that is where you would go into the firmware version. And if there is a new firmware version copied onto your memory card in here, it will then give you the option to upgrade to that firmware version. Do be careful that you uh, save your user profiles when you do that. Otherwise, you'll have to go back and do this all over again. Uh, language English, that's all good. So that is it. That is page seven finished. Back to page one focus mode. So we are done with the menu options. The next thing we're going to talk about is configuring the function buttons. And then after that, we're going to talk about configuring some other function buttons, which are new to this camera. Okay, now custom buttons. There are six of these. There's one here. FN. There's one to the right of the EVF here. There's two on the top. So that's four and five. And then on the front, if I just turn that towards you there, you should be able to see there's a rocker switch where my forefinger is there, which gives you access to two more. So that gives you many, many options for changing how you configure the camera. So the way they work is essentially long press so hold it down so now that you get all of the options that are possible we didn't turn any off before if you remember i'm going to leave function button on default toggle info info views info levels info views i think um, because that changes the display on the back of the camera the info profiles i think it's called in the actual menus leave that one alone the one to the right of the EVF should be defaulting to EVF to LCD. This allows you to change the behavior of these two uh, items. One, right now it's on default uh, of auto, which means that when I lift it to my eye, it will flick from the LCD to the EVF. If you set it to extended, that means that this is always off and this is off if your eye's not at the viewfinder, but it turns on when your eye does come to the viewfinder. Very, very useful if you want to uh, conserve battery. So I'm going to leave that on default. Now I'm going to change um, the top left-hand button. Sorry, the top right-hand button is going to change. Um, right now, it's on white balance, but I can access white balance much easier in another way, which again, we'll come to later. So I'm going to change this to ISO. Now you might wonder why I'm doing that because I made a, made a lot of trouble to make sure this dial is set to choose ISO. The reason that I do that is because I very rarely use this dial to change ISO except when I'm shooting on a tripod or I'm shooting video, in which case it's really useful to be able to access the uh, ISO with a dial. When I'm shooting handheld, the way I hold the camera is with my left hand copying the lens like this, 
that means that I can't use my left hand to access this dial. I've got to actually put my right hand across there and move the dial, which is not ideal for me. What I prefer to do is to actually click here and dial here, dial on that thumb dial. So I can do that without letting my hand um, come off the grip. I can do that with my forefinger easily and then my thumb here. So it accesses the ISO in a much easier way, in my opinion. Like I said, you set this camera up the way you want, that's absolutely fine. What we're doing here is just the way I seem to uh, prefer to work. So click there, go into your, your ISO there. So that's a change. Then we're also going to change the rocker switches on the front. So the top rocker switch right now is set to magnify. And if I then dial the dial, you'll see the little icon here changing. I don't need that. There are other ways of accessing magnification. What I'm gonna do on the top and the bottom rocker switch is access two menu items which you haven't seen before. They're not actually in the main menu because they, they're not they're things that you toggle on and off. So you don't wanna be going into the menu to choose them. The top one is called toggle focus points. So if I hold that down, and I have to scroll through quite a lot of options here to find it because there's 67 of them. So bear in, just bear with me whilst I find it. I've forgotten which page it's on. I think it's towards the top. Again, it's a good thing you only have to do this once. There it is, toggle focus point. And what this does, and this is very cool, is if I move my focus point away from the middle, then I hit that top uh, rocker switch, it pops back to the middle. Do that once again. So it's very easy to lose your focus point in the corner, especially when it's behind um, some information on the screen. You go, where's my focus point? All you've got to do is reach around the grip with your, one, with your third, uh, one, two, three, four, fourth finger, third finger, whichever one works for you, and just tap that and it's now back in the center of the screen. That is extremely useful and it's so hidden that a lot of people don't know that's there. So that's the top one. The bottom one by default is AF mode. Now I'm not really changing this very much and if I did need to change it, again, there's another way of changing it using the rear screen, which I'm gonna to come to in the next section. What I wanna do with this one is I want to set it to stabilizer on and off or I want to set it to DOF preview up to you. I'm going to set it to stabilizer because sometimes I want to turn the stabilizer on and off when I put it on a tripod. I'm not entirely sure whether it senses the fact that it's on a tripod and just turns it off or not. I play safe and I turn it off. So by clicking image stabilization here, when I hit the bottom button, you see it just toggles. It doesn't go to the menu for stabilization. It just toggles it on and off. It's also, when I'm on a gimbal and I'm shooting video, I will often turn stabilization off because the gimbal does the stabilization and you don't want them to be fighting each other. Okay, so that are the custom function buttons. The next thing we're gonna talk about are the custom function buttons that are now built into the rear screen, which is very interesting. We'll come to that in the next section. Okay, let's get on to the last set of custom functions. Now, it's not at all apparent, and it certainly uh, has never been the case in the past, but now I can also change the function of these eight items down here. It's a limited set of functions. There's not 67 like there are here. There's a, a limited set, and I am actually going to leave almost all of them alone except the bottom right-hand one. There's my white balance icon, but I'm going to change that, and the way I change it is I long press, just like you do with the others. And I'm going to change that to format card because I do format storage, there it is. Um, because I don't need to access this through this menu. There is a quicker way of doing it. But all of these make sense to me. These are things that I might change. For instance, I just noticed that this is set to exposure bracketing. This is where I would change my drive mode right here. I, wouldn't, I haven't set it to a custom function button because it's kind of a, a third level of control. These are your primary controls. 
Your function buttons are your secondary controls. These shortcuts are your tertiary controls, and then your menu is your fourth level of control, more of a configuration. These are for options, things that you change when you're shooting, but not very often. So I've kind of categorized them into those four levels. I use these controls all the time. I use the function buttons some of the time. I'll change other things a little bit at the time, and then the other things in menus, I won't change it hardly ever. Now, something else to bear in mind is that you can access, I'm going to change my info view, this is my clean view, this is my number three view, this is my number four view, and this is back to my number one view. In fact, I'm going to put that on number three, this has got everything on it. Because if you see on the right hand side here, you have user profile, um, power lats control, or perspective control, you have focus peaking, and I have self timer and aspect. These are active icons, as are all of these across the top. And the reason I turned off the, the, the focusing function on the back of the screen is because if I tap the screen now, I don't want to try and focus, I want to actually access the function of the icon, and it's a little bit fiddly. So if I want to turn on perspective control, I just have to press there and now I can turn on perspective control, okay? And the same with white balance up here. If I want to change my white balance, I've got access to white balance there. That's where I want it to be, not through a custom function button, just here, okay? But that is something that's quite new. Um, if I want to set the self timer, same thing as my self timer. Very, very quick and easy to access. The other thing I'm gonna show you, if I possibly can, is if I tilt the camera, you see they've just rotated. Hope you can see that. There they are, they're rotated and they haven't gone. I'll put them back to where they were. There we go. And you see that they've rotated if I tilted the camera. And then I'll just tilt the camera back to there and we can see they're back to normal. Very, very cool. Now, having been through all the menus, I need to go into my main menus. I'm going to go to user profile on page seven. I'm going to go to manage profiles save as profile and I'm going to use profile one save as profile one yes now if I then reset this to default pop, all of these settings are now back where we started from program mode large GNGs um, what have we got here the maximize 6400 etc etc what I need to do is to go into my menus I need to go to user profile I need to choose profile one now everything is back where I left it okay that profile that user profile is downloadable for you to use to save you going through all of these functions um, it's on a, a web page the link is in the description below the video but I have to warn you something very important is that the way that the profiles are loaded into the camera, it's all five. There's no way of doing only one. So when you import your user settings, it brings in all five user profiles. So if you set your own user profiles first, and you know how to do all this, don't use mine, okay? Because it will overwrite any other profiles that you've done. So it's just a bit of a warning. If you like what you've heard, and if you agree with what I've said, and you want to save yourself the trouble of going through all these options one at a time, and you haven't set up any uh, user profiles yet, feel free to download that uh, little file, copy it onto your um, SD card, which is under here, and then you can then go into your user profiles, and you can go to manage profiles, and you can import profiles, and that will pull that file off the card and load it in. OK, then rename it to something that makes sense for you. Right now, it'll just be profile number one. OK, but please don't do that if you've already configured your camera and saved it because it will overwrite everything. It won't just change the things that need changing. It will overwrite everything. OK, having said that, I hope that's useful for you. Um, I do strongly recommend that you give a lot of thought to how you set your camera up. The idea is it's an extension of your hand. It's not something that you need to continue to think about. The camera is uh, a tool that allows you to capture your vision and own the moment. Operating the camera isn't photography. Okay, the camera needs to get out of the way as quickly as possible. So by configuring the camera in sensible ways and then getting used to it, muscle memory will take over and you'll be able to make change your settings very very quickly without even thinking about it and that's where i'd like you to be
All right, my name is Nick Rains from Leica Camera Australia. Thank you very much for listening. I will no doubt talk to you again in a future video.